Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the first international webcast organized by Convertec on evidence on silver dressing technology, making choice clearer. All over the world, 4,000 clinicians from 20 different countries and here, live in London, from the British Medical Association, more than 40 clinicians from 14 countries are participating to this webcast conference. Two speakers will give lectures. The first one uh, is Professor Richard White, and he will be followed by Phil Bowler. At the end of the lectures, everyone will have the opportunity to ask questions. Now, let me introduce Professor Richard White. Professor Richard White, currently Professor of Tissue Viability at the University of Worcester in UK, work in wound care since years, and make a lecture uh, with the title uh, is Topical Silver in Created Dressing and the Importance of the Dressing Technology, a Review of Evidence. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Good, good day, everyone, wherever you might be. Before I actually get involved in the presentation itself proper, I just wanted to say a few words about silver, just to introduce it to our audience uh, here and worldwide. Silver isn't a new entity in terms of antimicrobial activity. Although the ancient Egyptians and Romans didn't know it, they knew that it had an effect in keeping water pure and in helping healthcare. Now we know that silver is a highly effective broad-spectrum antimicrobial, and we have medical literature and scientific literature to prove that beyond reasonable doubt. This is my starting point. I'm going to focus not on the silver per se, certainly Phil Bowler, who's speaking after me, will deal with that uh, in some depth, but I'm going to talk about the dressing technology, the technology behind that product which contains silver and how it performs to give that target that you, the clinicians, are looking for a predictable and optimal clinical outcome, as well as a, a, an effective economic outcome. Given the broad spectrum antimicrobial activity, the criteria for selecting a dressing are, in my opinion, as follows. The characteristic of what we might term the carrier dressing, what is holding that silver, and of course, last and certainly not least, we need to look at the needs of the wound over time, throughout not only a period of wear time of the dressing, but throughout a treatment period for that dressing. How is the wound changing? and how are its requirements, as well as the patient's requirements, changing. I hope to address all of those points to your satisfaction, at least in the presentation, if not in the question time as follows. Now, we certainly have in our audience, uh, in Dr. Kevin Wu, uh, one of the luminaries of wound-related pain in the world. Um, uh, sorry to uh, point that out to you, Kevin, but it's nevertheless a fact. Over the last 10 years or so, wound-related pain has justifiably become a very hot and important topic in wound care. Why? Because it has strong patient quality of life connotations, and there are also economic connotations. So pain at dressing change, a factor not unrelated to dressing adhesion, become important and they become important in the selection of the dressing that you are about to use. Probably less well known, 
is the need to eliminate dead space within the wound. Pockets where bacteria in a wound healing by secondary intent can thrive and develop and form a strong foothold whereby they can act as foci for potential infection in the wound. We now know that a dressing which provides for a close association with the wound bed, an intimate physical contact, will reduce dead space opportunity, will reduce microbial opportunity for growth. So this too then becomes a very important criterion when selecting a dressing. Fluid handling, the management of wound exudate, for every clinician is high on their agenda. One of the topics which perhaps gives them more headaches than anything else. How do I deal with wound exudate without deterioration into maceration, leakage, and all the attendant quality of life issues that the patient has to suffer if their wound uh, is leaking? And maceration, as any clinician knows, is something which is best avoided because once it's present, it becomes yet another clinical headache to manage and reverse. The following set of slides illustrate in the laboratory how the Aquacel hydrofiber dressing creates a close, uh, intimate relationship with the wound bed, thereby eliminating dead space. And what we have in this first image is animal flesh acting as a wound bed equivalent with the dressing on top, the hydrofiber dressing on top, and a hydrocolide retaining that in place. And as we go through the images, we see that the introduction of colored fluid here to simulate wound fluid emanating upwards is taken into the hydrofiber, which begins to swell. And in the next image, the hydrofiber has swollen considerably, but there are no dead spaces here between this simulated wound bed and the dressing, nor has this migrated laterally onto what in a human wound might be healthy surrounding skin. If we look at dressing structures, particularly in the context of interaction with exudate, we find that with a hydrofiber, here are fibers, integral fibers, here is uh, fluid, the interaction is one of fluid being taken into the fibrous structure itself. This is not a relationship such as occurs with a gauze dressing, where the fibers merely hold fluid by capillary action. That is very easily lost. This is very much less easily lost. Alginates and foams are in between the two. The clinical significance of this being that the dressing which will gel will create a moist wound environment which is not rapidly reversed by fluid loss. Whereas the gauze dressing, as an example, will lose fluid as easily as it takes it up. This is demonstrated very nicely in this simple laboratory test. Here's an alginate dressing sat across a Petri dish which once contained a blue dyed liquid. Here's a dry, uh, dry gauze-like dressing in the same situation, and here is a hydrofiber. And it's quite clear that the hydrofiber here has taken up the blue-colored liquid and retained it only in the area in contact with the fluid, whereas in these other instances, the fluid has migrated laterally. Looking at this in terms of uh, multiple applications. What we have here are four different uh, colored fluids. 
The aquacell dressing has been dipped in each sequentially, and you can see there very neatly that there is no lateral migration uh, of the, the colored pigment. If you do this with a gauze or an alginate, you will see that the colors merge together. So there is a free diffusion throughout the dressing. This not being the case with hydrofiber. Another aspect of dressing performance which becomes important, and one which is as yet not uh, widely known, is the potential for the dressing to sequester and take hold of microorganisms within a wound. The capacity to absorb and retain bacteria in a wound is an important infection control mechanism because it reduces the bio burden in the wound. It has an impact on any toxins, whether they be exo or endotoxins. And as I've already said, a cross infection risk reduction. And that can be de demonstrated quite elegantly by scanning electron microscopy, where here we have individual fibers of hydrofiber, and in here, thousands upon thousands of Staphylococcus aureus sequestered onto the dressing fiber. Now we started talking about silver, and our focus is a silver dressing. And the characteristics that make that silver dressing functionally perform, and perform well are its delivery of silver as well as those ancillary performance characteristics that I've just been through. If we look at aquacell silver, we are told that it delivers silver at low levels. But these are antimicrobially, antimicrobially active low levels. There is a seven day sustained release. What is the significance of this? Well, other aspects of the dressing, such as its gelling uh, and moist wound healing capacity, realistically make this a dressing which can stay in place for seven days. If you want it to be antimicrobially active for seven days, then clearly this is an important criterion. There is no point having a dressing which will deliver silver for seven days if its maximum wear time is only one or two days. It's also a sustained release, and both are very important. Phil Bowler will speak after me upon matters of silver release that are relevant to wound bioburden control. Very important clinical performance criterion. Skin staining is obviously an issue for everyone who is using silver because it can hardly escape any of us that the uh, risks of skin staining or, or argyria are present. We've learned this from long experience with silver sulfadiazine cream. Does this necessarily translate to wound dressings? Well, the answer is not to the same extent, but again, not all wound dressings are the same. And there are published data on Aquacell AG, which shows its skin staining potential to be extremely low indeed. So this need not be an issue for the clinician. Now, although you can't see it on this slide, right down here it says white 2003. Many years ago, and uh, 2003 is many years ago in my lifetime, I considered, as silver dressings were just becoming a uh, very hot property on the wound care market in the UK and elsewhere, what are the important features that a clinician needs to be aware of in order to make the right selection? And I think my first one is, is probably uh, the most pertinent because it has to deliver silver. You are using a silver dressing in order to obtain an express clinical outcome. Whether the wound you're treating is critically colonized or locally infected, you have an objective in mind for the use of that dressing that you want that dressing to fulfill 
and fulfill quite clearly. And this is how it does it. The combination of antimicrobial effect and the capacity to absorb exudate go hand in glove. Is the bio burden a wound problem for you? If the wound is dry, you're thinking to yourselves, when does that ever happen? A wound that is heavily colonized, locally infected, will invariably be exuding. You therefore have to deal with the exudate at the same time that you deal with the bio burden. Here we have a powerful health economic case to address. Do you use two dressings to do that, or do you use one? Is the dressing easy to apply and remove? Does it come off without traumatizing the wound and causing the patient pain? Is it comfortable for the patient during wear time? Because if that is the case, you will get the cooperation of the patient for future use of this product, what we are terming concordance or compliance in this country. If you have compliance from the patient, you're more likely to get a positive beneficial outcome. Cost effectiveness is tied up in the achievement of multiple clinical objectives with a single product. That is exudate control, silver delivery and bio burden reduction, as well as comfort. Now my references are here. My uh, contacts here in Convitec would be more than happy to share them with you. Madam Chairman, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much for this brilliant lecture, Richard. Now let me introduce uh, Phil Bowler. He's a uh, director of global research and development uh, anti-infectives in Convatec in UK. Uh, Phil is internationally recognized for uh, his expertise uh, and extensive work in microbiology, in infection, and infection control. So uh, tonight, uh, the lecture of uh, Phil is on the impact of dressing technology on antimicrobial activity of silver-containing dressings. Thank you, Sylvie. Good evening, everybody here at the British Medical Association and to everybody around the world also. In Richard's presentation, he spoke to you about the, the role of dressing technology in wound management. I'd just like to take that a step further now and talk about the effect of dressing technology in the antimicrobial performance of silver-containing dressings. Before I do so, I'd just like to talk very briefly about bacteria in wounds, because if bacteria didn't exist in wounds, then we wouldn't need antimicrobial dressings. And we know that bacteria can be a problem. Uh, bacteria in chronic wounds originate from many sources. They originate from the skin surrounding the wound. They also originate from the mouth of the individual that has a wound and also the gut. So ultimately, the microbiology in chronic wounds is very complex organisms from many different uh, locations and sources all working together. It's a complex microflora that if we don't control, it can become a problem. Most of the organisms, because they originate from external sources, are present in the superficial part of the wound, as you can see in this slide here. So if we're looking at the use of antimicrobial dressings, then the importance and the role of the antimicrobial dressing is to essentially control this superficial bio burden, stop it becoming a problem to the host, stop the organisms invading deeper viable tissue and causing infection. And if we look back to the, the barriers to wound healing, the time concept uh, that originated in the, uh, the early 2000s, we see that bacteria play a significant role in terms of infection, inflammation, and most recently, uh, biofilm also. I've added the, the term biofilm now because it's widely recognized that, that biofilm uh, does exist in chronic wounds, bacteria actually produce biofilm themselves. It's a matrix that they secrete. It makes them more 
uh, resistant to antibiotics, to antiseptics, and also to host immune cells. So this is a, an emerging area in wound care that we need to be uh, very aware of. So, if we consider antimicrobial dressings, there are a number of factors that may affect how well an antimicrobial dressing may work. There are both wound-related factors and also dressing-related factors. From a wound perspective, the depth and the size of the wound might be important. The amount of devitalized tissue may also be important because it can act as a barrier to the availability of the antimicrobial agent to, to the bacteria in the wound. The level of exudate and also the viscosity of the exudate. If the exudate is, is quite viscous, then it's less likely to be absorbed readily, readily into the dressing and therefore the antimicrobial agent may not work as effectively. And also the extent of wound bio burden and the presence of biofilm in wounds. Then there are dressing related factors such as the type and the concentration of the antimicrobial agent. In terms of antiseptics, we know that commonly used uh, antiseptics such as iodine and silver are both very effective. They both work against a broad spectrum of microorganisms. Um, they're both very effective. They work very fast in wounds. Uh, the concentration of the agent may be important, but then with silver, ionic silver, which is the active form of silver, we know that the physiological environment within a wound dictates how much free silver can be available at any one point in time. So in terms of silver, more silver does not mean more effective. The availability of the antimicrobial agent from its vehicle, from the dressing, this is very important because if the antimicrobial agent is locked within the dressing, then it's not going to do its job in killing the bacteria where it needs to kill them. And also the, the ability of addressing to closely contact an irregular wound topography. Every wound is unique in its shape, in its, in its size, in its wound topography. So ideally, if a dressing is applied to a wound, if that dressing can absorb exudate and conform very closely to the contours of that wound, then if the dressing contains an antimicrobial agent, in theory, you're most likely to, to create greatest exposure of the antimicrobial agent in the dressing to the bacteria at the wound surface. And it's this last point that prompted us to do some work um, at Convertec uh, last year um, to try to investigate further the effects of dressing conformability on antimicrobial action of silver containing dressings. We developed a model, a very simple model, uh, but a very reproducible model in the laboratory called a shallow uh, wound microbial model. And this is it represented in, in this particular slide here. We used an agar plate, large agar plates, into the center of which we place two pieces of sterile gauze. One is four by four centimeters, uh, and we overlay that with another piece of gauze, five by five centimeters. We then flood that uh, agar plate with another layer of agar so that the gauze becomes embedded within a second layer of agar such that when the agar sets we can carefully remove the gauze and we're left with what we call our simulated shallow wound. So this area has got a roughened base because of the gauze imprint, it's got a graduated side and it's about two to three millimeters in depth. So if we slice through one of the agar plates, we can see this simulated shallow wound area with the roughened base and the graduated edge. So at that point, we inoculate this simulated shallow wound with bacteria. With a suspension of bacteria, we inoculate four milliliters of a suspension that completely fills this um, simulated shallow wound area and we inoculate around 4,000 viable cells of either uh, Staphylococcus aureus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We then apply a full intact dressing as would be done clinically 
You can see the dressing being applied aseptically here with the release line has been removed, the dressing being placed over this simulated shallow wound. And again, as it would be done clinically, so that the dressing is placed centrally and it overlaps and sits on the surrounding prominent agar that would be akin to uh, skin surrounding a wound. The dressing is then gently uh, secured into place um, over the inoculated agar surface. And at that point, we then incubate this plate at body temperature for 48 hours, which is an approximate time for uh, wear time of, of a dressing of this type. And after that time point, after 48 hours, we remove the dressing and we look to see whether the silver containing dressing had any effect on the bacteria inoculated into the simulated shallow wound area. Now, what we also did as part of this experiment was to use time-lapse photography. We actually placed a camera beneath the agar plate and we took photographs at regular intervals over the 48-hour period such that we could put a video together to observe whether bacteria were actually growing in situ under the dressing over the 48-hour period. So here we have one of the uh, time-lapse photographs. You can see it already taking place. This is with Aquacell AG. The dressing, this is the dressing here. This is a cover dressing, um, an adhesive uh, hydrofiber cover dressing. This is the inoculated uh, area. And you can see over the 48-hour period, one colony will form here. So the 4,000 cells that were inoculated, you've got one colony appearing here. Here we have a leaving AG adhesive dressing again over the inoculated area over 48 hours. And you can see these colonies actually forming beneath the dressing. So despite this dressing containing silver, it wasn't able to control the bacteria. And then with another dressing, this is Mepilex AG. Again, over time, you can see the bacterial colonies growing within the inoculated area. Uh, but we all, what we also noted was that the, uh, the suspension had actually spread out onto the prominent agar and was growing around the inoculated area. So, if we look at these three dressings again, we see that despite all these dressings containing silver, they, in this model, they appear to work in very different ways. So here we have um, Aquacell AG. Uh, on this particular example, uh, three colonies of, of Staph aureus beneath the dressing after 48 hours uh, with uh, Alevian AG adhesive dressing, considerable growth of the Staph aureus beneath the dressing in the inoculated area, but also we see this lateral spread of bacteria. And with Mepilex AG, again, considerable growth uh, in the area where the bacteria were inoculated. But again, we see in this lateral spread beneath the dressing, an actual growth of the Staph aureus on the wound contact surface of the dressing. So despite this dressing containing silver, the bacteria were able to grow on the surface of the dressing. So this made us think further because in this respect where bacteria contaminated this prominent agar, there was direct contact between the dressing and the agar. So this indicated to us that there may be factors other than dressing conformability that was compromising the activity of this silver containing dressing. So we developed a, another simple laboratory model to look at this in more detail. We call this the flat seeded agar model. The way we, we generate this is this represents uh, another agar plate here. The green zone is a sterile layer of agar within the plate. We then pour another layer of molten agar over the top of the sterile agar layer. This second layer is inoculated with bacterial cells either Staph aureus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
This layer forms a, a layer approximately two millimeters thick. So this is a, a seeded agar layer approximately two millimeters thick. We allow this second layer of agar to solidify and then incubate this plate for, for approximately four hours to allow the bacteria to begin to establish. After four hours, we take the plates out of the incubator and we apply, apply full intact dressings again to the surface of the agar plate. And as we did in the last experiment, we incubate for 48 hours, which is an approximate wear time for these dressings. After 48 hours, we remove the dressings, we photograph and we observe whether bacteria had actually grown or not grown beneath the dressings. Also, after the 48 hour dressing contact period, we then incubated the plates without the dressing for a further 24 hours. And this was to allow any viable bacteria to mature into full bacterial colonies. So after this additional 24 hours, if we saw bacterial growth in this seeded agar layer, this indicated that the dressing that had been applied to that seeded agar layer had no antimicrobial activity. If there was no visible growth in the seeded agar layer, then this indicated that either the bacteria had been inhibited, so meaning that the dressing was bacteria static, or the bacteria had been killed, meaning that the dressing was bactericidal. So to determine whether the dressing was bacteriostatic or bactericidal, we take a small sample of the agar, the top layer of agar that had been seeded with bacteria, and we spread that small sample of agar onto a fresh agar plate. And we reincubate that plate for 24 hours and look for bacterial growth. If we see bacterial growth on this agar plate, then it means that the dressing that had been applied was bacteriostatic. It had inhibited the bacteria, but had not killed them. If there's no bacterial growth on this subculture plate, then the dressing that had been applied was bactericidal. So these are the results uh, that we, we produced using this flat agar model. You can see we used two organisms, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staphylococcus aureus, silver containing dressings that we tested here, Aquacella AG, uh, two forms of Alevian AG, uh, two forms of Mepilex AG, and also silver cell non-adherent dressing. Using this model, the only bactericidal dressing was Aquacell AG against both organisms. The Alevian AG and Mepilex AG dressings had no effect. They weren't, they weren't bacteriostatic nor bactericidal. The bacteria actually grew beneath the dressings. Silver cell was the only bacteriostatic dressing uh, against both Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So if you look at some of the examples, some of the example plates uh, where we tested these dressings, here we have an agar plate inoculated with Staph aureus. So this is the seeded agar uh, containing Staph aureus. This is where Aquacell AG dressing was placed. And you can see that beneath the dressing uh, in that seeded agar layer, there was no visible bacterial growth. So when we take a small culture of the agar from the center and we subculture it, again, we see no growth, meaning that the dressing is bactericidal in this model. If we look in detail at, at the dressing, um, it consists of um, fibers, homogeneously distributed fibers containing ionic silver, and there is direct exposure of these silver containing hydrofibers to the bacteria inoculated beneath them. If we look at one of the other dressings tested, leaving AG gentle border dressing, you can see that there's considerable growth of Staph aureus beneath this dressing. 
Another example with silver cell non-adherent dressing. Again, you can see the bacteria growing around the periphery of the plate. There appears to be uh, minimal growth of Staph aureus beneath the silver cell non-adherent dressing. Uh, there is some indication of growth here. And when we do take a stab culture from the center of the plate and subculture that onto a fresh plate, it does grow, indicating that, that in this test, uh, silver cell non-adherent dressing is bacteriostatic, it inhibits bacteria, but it doesn't kill them. Another example, Mepilex AG dressing. You can see the imprint of the dressing on the agar plate, but there is total growth of Staph aureus beneath this dressing. So this led us to, to look at this in a bit more detail. Clearly, this dressing contains silver in the form of silver sulfate, but it had no effect on the bacteria inoculated directly beneath the dressing. So we took this one stage further and we actually sliced the dressing down the center and used one of the exposed edges to place on a similar seeded agar plate to see whether the exposed edge of the dressing had any antimicrobial effect. And this are the results here with Mepilex AG dressing. What we have here is a seeded agar plate with Staph aureus. This is the wound contact layer or surface of Mepilex AG applied to the seeded agar. And we see complete growth of Staph aureus as we did in the previous slide. This is the top surface, the upper surface of the dressing. And although there is some bacterial growth, we actually see more activity than we do with the wound contact surface of this dressing. But then when we cut the dressing down the center and place one of the exposed edges, we do see antimicrobial activity. With Aquacel AG dressing, irrespective of the orientation of the dressing, whether it's one surface or the other surface or the edge of a dressing, we see total kill of the bacteria beneath the dressing. Whilst this is our work, uh, this type of data has been generated elsewhere. Um, here I'm referring to an article published by Kavanagh et al. Um, in 2010, a group from the University of Alberta where they were using antimicrobial methods to, to look at the efficacy of silver containing dressings. They used uh, a similar uh, type of test to, to those that I've just demonstrated now. Uh, and they went on to state in, in their article that although the dressing they were referring to Mepilex AG contains a large quantity of soluble silver in its current configuration, it has neither wound fluid absorption capacity nor antimicrobial activity. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'd just like to move on to talk about a, a different aspect of, of wound microbiology, and that is of the emerging superbugs that we're hearing a lot more about today, organisms, bacteria that are a major threat to public health in general, organisms that are showing increased resistance to antibiotics, organisms that are showing in increased virulence, so they're more pathogenic. These organisms also have the ability to tolerate environmental stresses, so they survive in the environment and therefore they can spread much more easily. And examples of these organisms today are community acquired methicillin resistant Staph aureus, significant problem both in, in Europe uh, and the US. Clostridium difficile, uh, most commonly associated with, with gut infections, but we've actually isolated uh, C. difficile from wounds, fecal flora that finds uh, its way into wounds. Asanita bomanii, this is a significant um, problematic organism, both in, in the hospital environment, associated with hospital-acquired infections, but also in the battlefield, it's the most prevalent organism in war wound infections. And also extended spectrum beta-lactamase bacteria, uh, those known as the ESBLs. Um, these are gram-negative bacteria, such as Klebsiella and E. coli, uh, and also Pseudomonas. So there are a whole mix of organisms, bacterial organisms today, 
recognised as superbugs that are becoming an increasing threat uh, in healthcare today. All these organisms can be found in wounds. They don't necessarily cause infection, but they can be found in wounds. And as a consequence, we've started to look at the efficacy of Aquacel AG against these organisms. We've used a model that we've used uh, previously, first published in, in 2004, that we call a simulated wound fluid model, where we take uh, a suspension of bacteria. That suspension contains a bacterial growth medium, and it's supplemented with serum. So the serum provides lots of components within it, proteins and ions that can compete with silver when you apply a silver dressing to the simulated wound fluid. So into the simulated wound fluid, we place a small sample of the Aquacel AG dressing. We inoculate these various superbugs individually into the simulated wound fluid. And over a period of days, seven days, we take samples of the fluid from around the dressing and we look for the effect of the dressing uh, on these superbugs. So here we have um, a graph that, that looks at the efficacy of Aquacel AG against this um, pretty nasty organism, Acinetobacter bolmanii. We've looked at three different strains of this organism. On the y-axis, we've got the numbers of bacteria. This was the inoculation point, uh, around about a million cells per mil into the simulated wound fluid. Uh, on the x-axis, we have time, uh, number of days. The dotted lines across the top of the graph represent the growth of these strains of bacteria in the absence of Aquacel AG. In the presence of Aquacel AG, you can see that with all three strains, there is rapid uh, reduction in the bacterial population in this very stringent medium um, and within 24 hours no detectable bacteria. The reason we see a spike at day two is that at that time point we re-inoculate the simulated wound fluid with fresh bacteria, with fresh uh, strains uh, of Acinetobacter bolmanii because in a wound environment no antibiotic no antiseptic will, will sterilize a wound. There will always be some organisms there. So we try to simulate that and create a more stringent environment by re-inoculating bacteria at this time point. But again, that one piece of dressing was shown to maintain its efficacy in killing the organisms and non, uh, no further organisms were detected throughout the, the test period. If we look at uh, two other organisms, community-acquired MRSA and C. difficile, again, the dotted lines across the top represent the growth of these organisms, uh, natural growth curves in the absence of Aquacel AG. In the presence of, of Aquacel AG, we see reduction, uh, less so with uh, MRSA, the community-acquired MRSA. Every bacterium will have different tolerances to an antimicrobial agent, whether it's an antibiotic or an antiseptic. So it's not unusual to see uh, gradual declines with some bacteria compared to rapid declines with other. Uh, the cell wall is, is variable. It differs in different types of organisms. But it, so this is why we see variable activity. But again, uh, with community-acquired MRSA, we see this decline, re-inoculate uh, at day two, and then a constant decline to non-detectable by day seven. Uh, with Clostridium difficile, um, Aquacel AG was very effective against this organism. Rapid decline, uh, re-inoculate at day, day two, and uh, again, a subsequent rapid decline of this organism. And again, looking at the extended spectrum beta-lactamase bacteria, again, the natural growth curves for these organisms here we're using two strains of highly antibiotic-resistant E. coli and one strain of antibiotic-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, but irrespective of these organisms being highly antibiotic-resistant, so in a wound environment, if these organisms were to exist, antibiotics are not likely to work against these organisms, or very selective antibiotics only would be effective against these organisms. But here, we're showing that Aquacel AG is very effective in killing these organisms, re-inoculation, 
and again um, kill. So I, I think this also emphasizes the importance of topical antimicrobial dressings in helping to manage infected wounds and certainly those at risk of infection. They may be used with, in combination with, antibiotics and together they may work synergistically um, or where the wound is only locally infected um, or there is a risk of infection, then maybe the dressings alone can be used. So in summary, the incorporation of an antimicrobial agent into a dressing does not necessarily result in an effective antimicrobial dressing because that antimicrobial agent must be made available to the wound buyer burden to maintain its control. And finally, Aquacel AG dressings exhibit broad spectrum and sustained antimicrobial activity, including activity against antibiotic resistant and emerging superbugs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Phil, for this very clear and exciting presentation. Now continue and go on live question and answer question. I have a question from Canada. Uh, this question perhaps is for Richard. Should the silver product be placed directly on the wound? Uh, does using a screen or interface on the wound to prevent the silver product from sticking inhibit the silver from penetrating? Right, these are good points. They address real clinical issues. I think if I refer back to the presentation that I've given you a little earlier this evening, I can illustrate how best to do this. We need to have the right concentration of silver in the right place at the right time for the right duration. We also need to have a vehicle or a carrier dressing which can be removed as and when the clinician decides it's appropriate. With, with respect to interface materials, I see no need for them if you have a non-adherent dressing, a truly non-adherent dressing. Uh, similarly, if the dressing is providing the right concentration of silver for the right period of time, uh, those are your clinical objectives met in one product. So we don't need to complicate the issue. I think the issue is choose the right dressing, use it according to the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, that will then give you the best opportunity to achieve the clinical outcome that you want at an effective cost. Uh, a question on cost. Uh, a, a question is coming from uh, uh, Denmark. Can you give us an argument that using a silver dressing like Aquasil uh, it's or should be uh, cost effective? Well, cost effectiveness is, is something that's not usually consistently defined. It depends uh, who you're listening to. There are people who actually believe cost effectiveness is simply unit cost of product. I would prefer to look at it as the economists do at the cost of achieving a given outcome. And that's an altogether more complicated uh, calculation to embark upon. So first of all, set yourself a clinical target to achieve and then measure the costs of the products, the time, all the interventions needed to achieve that clinical target. And it is certainly not as simplistic as the individual cost of a given dressing. Thank you. A question from Scotland, perhaps for Phil. Is a higher dose of silver more effective at reducing bacterial levels than a lower dose of silver? I think I, I, I briefly uh, addressed this at, at the outset of, of my presentation. Certainly with respect to silver, I mentioned that the active form of silver is the silver iron or ionic silver. Any other form of silver that may be delivered to a wound, whether it's a silver salt, silver silver diazine, silver nitrate, metallic silver, 
any type of silver of those forms need to transition to ionic silver to become effective. Ionic silver is very weakly, positively electric, electrically charged, um, and it has an attraction for negatively charged ions, and in, in wound fluid, wound exudate, um, the most abundant anion, negatively charged ion, is, is chloride. So there is this natural affinity for silver ions with chloride, and it's this physiological environment within the wound that dictates how much free silver, free ionic silver, can be available at any one point in time. So the more silver you deliver doesn't mean that it's more effective because with the presence of chloride in a wound environment, silver ions will bind to chloride ions um, at low levels uh, and, and precipitate as, as silver chloride, which is not effective. So the wound environment itself is dictating how much free silver can be available at any one point in time. So no, I'd, more silver is not necessarily better. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from US, uh, perhaps for Richard. Is there a time limit on how long you, uh, you should use a silver dressing on a chronic wounds? Again, an extremely important issue and an, an issue related to um, health economics as well. Whenever I speak to an audience about using an antimicrobial, I always emphasize that there are different stages in your argument. First of all, why have you selected to use such a product in the first instance? What are you aiming to achieve? Do you have a wound that is critically colonized or infected? It is very important to establish the reason for using the product. At the same time you select a product, you should be setting a clinical target in your own minds, which you would document in the notes, as to what you are expecting to achieve. Simply to apply a product with no defined expectation over time is irresponsible. So quite reasonably, if you're treating a critically colonized wound, it's reasonable to expect that your target would be to achieve a, a restart in the healing process. If the wound is clinically infected locally, and you have judged that by various uh, important criteria, such as pain increase, exudate increase, delayed healing, uh, what have you, your objectives must include some way of measuring whether those have been addressed so you would be specifically looking to achieve a reduction in pain, a reduction in the exudate level, and a stimulation of healing as, as manifested by granulation or re at the margins. Thank you. Uh, and another question from Italy. Uh, this question is not from Slade, but I, I, I try to understand it. Uh, do you think uh, resistance uh, exists against silver dressing? Um, still, resistance to silver has, has been reported. Um, my opinion is that, that uh, resistance to silver is not a problem in wound care whatsoever. Um, silver is an antiseptic, uh, very different to antibiotics, of course, where we see widespread resistance <clears throat> to, to antibiotics. So the last 60 to 70 years, uh, during the time that uh, antibiotics have, have been used, we've seen quite rapid emergence of resistance. Uh, silver has been in the environment for nearly four billion years now, as have bacteria, and we don't see wide uh, resistance to silver. And we did publish on this uh, in the Journal of Hospital Infection back in, in 2004. There are three papers um, that I think are, are very useful, uh, looking at uh, silver resistance in, in wound isolates. One is from a study in Hong Kong um, in Burns wounds, uh, they looked at um, the level of silver resistance in burn wound isolates. They found the prevalence to be very low. They found resistance in only one strain of bacterium that was uh, an organism called Enterobacter cloacae. Uh, there was another study performed in London, um, here in the UK, uh, again looking at silver resistance in wound isolates from leg ulcers. Again, they showed the prevalence to be very low. They also showed 
that, that resistance, when it did occur, was, was in the same organism, Entrobacter cloacae. We've done our own research um, in isolates from diabetic foot wounds. We've come up with the same conclusions that the prevalence of sil resistance is very low. We've actually looked for genetic resistance. But again, we found the only organism that contained any sil resistance genes was Entrobacter cloacae. So there really is a commonality. Uh, we don't know why, but three totally independent studies have found only one type of organism to have any level of sil resistance. This organism can be found in wounds. It's not a pathogen in wounds, um, and, and it's, it's, it's not a problem. So I think there is uh, adequate evidence now, uh, including uh, our own research, to show that, that, that sil resistance is not a problem. And certainly, in my opinion, the, the benefits of using silver appropriately in wound care far outweigh any concern there may be uh, with uh, resistance occurring. I'd just like to add a quick comment to that. Um, silver has been a mainstay in burns therapy for 40 years since silver sulfadiazine was developed and formed into a cream uh, back in the mid-60s. And that is gradually falling into disuse now, not because of resistance problems, but because of the problems associated with covering burns with uh, handfuls of cream. Um, so there would have been ample opportunity in human clinical situations for organisms to be selected uh, as resistant to silver, and we are just not seeing it. So it's, um, as Phil says, uh, not uh, completely unknown, but not clinically relevant. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now we have to close uh, uh, this very interesting uh, webcast uh, conference. I would like uh, to thank uh, first our two presenters, uh, Professor Richard White and Phil Boller. Thank you also uh, to the audience for question and participation. And thank you to Convatec uh, to, to invest since years in innovative and uh, new technology uh, to improve quality of life of our patient, to improve science and improve education. Thanks.